Welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Walinga and I'm a professor at Rural Roads University. Welcome to the Sport Leadership and Social Change webinar series. For episode two, we've been investigating women, leadership, and sport. And we have a few segments to this episode. We were lucky enough to speak with Kate Bruness, Sheila Robertson, and Nancy Hogshead Makar. And I hope to have a 2.5 episode a little bit later in the year of 2021 around International Women's Day in March. But let's start with Kate. I'm lucky enough to have interacted with Kate a few times. She's kind of a hero of mine in that she's one of the one of those first women sportscasters with TSN on the show Sports Center. And she's so lucky to be on the sidelines with the Raptors, one of my favorite teams. Great to watch her, and I think she's doing a fabulous job. So today I wanted to ask her about sport and the role that it plays in her life and how uh, it's taught her various lessons that have translated into her uh, professional world. I also wanted to ask about an initiative that she started called Her Mark. Uh, it's an annual summit that's designed to empower young women and introduce them to leadership opportunities within sport. You can find Kate on Twitter. She's a very active tweeter and uh, really leverages her social platform for change. And a little bit of information about how her initiative of promoting young women in sport and, and introducing them to leaders in sport like Kia Nurse and others has evolved into this amazing podcast. And she also hosted a special through TSN during the pandemic, because of course it's going to be impossible to bring everybody face to face. So I just want to introduce Kate Burness and uh, thank you all for joining us for our conversation. Yes. Okay, welcome Kate Burness, great to see you always. Great to be here. Loving all the work that you're doing in sport, of course, I covet your job. I remember seeing you get this role with TSN you know, years ago and thinking, oh, way to go, Kate, this is so <laughs> great to see and what a fantastic world you must live in. Yeah, it's a different world right now, I'll tell you that. But you know what, I, I never take my job for granted. And, um, it, you know, especially now that sports are back and, you know, and you know that the NBA is coming back again too. I mean, after that pause, I swear, I mean, I've never taken my job for granted to start, but now more than ever. So it is, it, it's very, very exciting. It's very different right now, obviously with the no travel and staying at home. But I mean, I still can't believe to this day I get paid to talk about sports. Best. <laughs> you should. I think sports are the most important thing really in the world. And I'm increasingly feeling that way. And, and I'm so happy that Royal Rose is embracing it as well. And we're having all sorts of great courses and programming. So welcome to this webinar. We're exploring sport, leadership and society, social change, the impact sport can have increasingly through COVID we're seeing the impact sport can have. You know, your Raptors were heroes in addressing some of the core cultural issues that were emerging this year. So great to see. Um, I wanna to talk to you about specifically about uh, the topic of today's episode, which is women, leadership, and sports. You've been a leader in sport. Can you start by telling us a bit about the role sports played in your life and what, what's made it important for you? Well, Jennifer, I'm still trying to be a pro athlete, just in case you were wondering. Um, <laughs> just like every sportscaster in the entire world. You know, you, you just mentioned it too. I mean, sport is to me everything. It taught me uh, pretty much everything in life that I needed to know. Um, I fell in love with it. I think like so many athletes, not that I consider myself an athlete, but like people who love sport at such a young age, um, I mean, playing soccer, I think at four, um, the minute I started dribbling a basketball, I don't think there was a moment um, that it was ever out of my hands when it was a nice day outside and I could be in the driveway. And there's just something about sport um, as a kid that I was just so drawn to. I am so crazy competitive, um, maybe to a fault. And it's gotten better with age, but it's still right there. <laughs> and uh, I just, I love being part of a team as well. Um, I'm more of a team sport athlete than an individual athlete. It's not that I don't like individual sports, I do. Um, there's something about knowing the strengths of other people and putting it together that I've always appreciated. And I think that works well in any aspect of life. 
Um, I also found at a really young age, um, you know, the ability to deal with losing um, mm. is a really good one too. So sportsmanship, because uh, life doesn't just hand you stuff on a platter. It really doesn't. Um, you're not going to get every job. You're not going to get every opportunity, but it's how you handle it. I think that really sets you up for either success or failure. So, I mean, I could literally do your entire webinar right now on what sports does for life, but those would be probably the main points of why I love it so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the failure piece, right. And being able to take it, download, learn, move on and, uh, and not take it as this devastating thing that's going to change your life and make it horrible, you know, right on. Um, and why do you think it's so important for girls in particular? Because I'm going to ask you about her mark in a minute, but why in particular for girls to stay in sport, participate in sport? I think there's a number of reasons. Um, I think the biggest one uh, for myself personally is probably confidence. And, you know, when you win and you lose as well, too, and, but you do something as a team, you learn together as a team, or even in individual sports, um, you learn so much from it. And whether you win or lose, you do gain a confidence. Um, and I think out in the real world, the biggest thing I think that has always really helped me in the world I do live in um, is the fact that I'm just confident in my ability. I'm confident in who I am and, and what I can bring. I'm not intimidated um, by pro athletes, um, by big celebs, if you will. And that all came from sports, uh, knowing what I was good at in sports. Um, you, you know, I wasn't the best shooter in the entire world, but I got really decent hands. So I knew that I could do one aspect of the game, not the other. It's the same thing when it comes to reporting, whether it be sidelines for the Raptors or on the desk. You know, I know I'm really good at reading highlights, probably not as good at you know, writing, for example. So I play to my strengths, but I'm confident in my abilities that I can do particularly things really well. And I think the important part for girls too is just to, to stick with it. Cause it only gets, you learn more and more about yourself too um, in sport, in my opinion. So I, I absolutely hate seeing the statistics when I see girls drop out at a rapid pace. And I know we're gonna talk about her mark. Um, but that's, that's the thing too. And sticking with it too, like as I got up into higher levels of basketball, I, I got progressively worse because I was playing much better women, right? Like much more talented women. So the thing was to stick with it though and try to learn from those women too was critically important. So there are a lot of aspects of it, but I think too, just, just seeing it through and playing as long as you possibly can is just critically important to growth as a human. Growth. Mm -hmm. And I love when you mention, you know, it's such a paradox where you say you're super competitive, but you also have the humility and integrity to be able to look at uh, your competitor and learn and understand that it, actually it's totally collaborative, not in a nicey, nice way. It's like you're pushing each other, yeah. uh, but that's the beauty of competition. It's not a negative thing, learning from women. And uh, is there... Is there, I love as well how you're translating the learning, you know, what you learn in sport and then you're making sense of it at the desk uh, or in your professional world or on the sidelines. Awesome. And is there a story in particular that, that strikes you or that has been impactful for you when you think of, you know, the importance of sport, the importance of women in sport, particular person that impacts you? Yeah, I would say, I mean, if I'm looking at person, I would 100% say Doris Burke. And I know I've probably said it so many times before and I'll never stop saying it. Um, but it's important to, to what I think we right now as female sportscasters are trying to do as well. Um, Doris was alone. Uh, Doris was doing it on, by herself. She was a color commentator in the 90s um, for professional men's basketball in the NBA, the first to do it of her kind. I couldn't even imagine the backlash that that woman got for doing just her job and being darn good at her job, by the way, too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you talk about learning and like when I was on the basketball court and I got to play with some pretty incredible people. I mean, I remember playing a team from this club called Transway where Kia Nurse, if you look up girls that have come from Transway, they're phenomenal. And just being in awe of their skill set and wanting, wanting to know how they did it differently. Well, the same thing goes with Doris Burke. I mean, I think she is one of the brightest people on air. I remember interviewing an assistant coach, just the two of us once, and her level of knowledge. I think I'm knowledgeable. She blew me out of the water. And I was like, you know what? And this was only a couple of years ago. I'm like, I need to work harder because this woman, this woman is doing 10 times the research that I currently have. So I think like, 
you know, having someone like that, um, that you can not only aspire to be, but knowing what they did before you so you could do your job is one of the most incredible things in the entire world. So I just truly hope that, I mean, we get a little bit of backlash still being women in sport, but I think by this point in 2020, people know that we're doing our jobs because we know what we're doing. But like for her, it was just like, get off the air, you know, get back to the kitchen, whatever the comments were, they were probably something along those lines. Um, but I just hope that the next generation doesn't even have to deal with you know, some, like something about my looks, like I'll get comments on my outfits all the time and stuff like that. Like you never talk to a guy about that. You're just going to talk to a woman about that. So I would say, you know, just building off what Doris already did is critically important for this next generation of female sportscasters. Right on. You raised some really important points and the importance of being able to shed these cultural norms that really hold women back, right? Like, that you have to be, you have to look a certain way, or do you know what you're doing? Of course. So, so women before you and including you have established, yes, we can do it. We can obviously, we're strong. We can obviously play. We can obviously report. Uh, so that's kind of done deal. Uh, but there's also kind of expectations, these cultural expectations of what a woman is. And that seems to get in the way uh, for girls, I think particularly, you know, they're being told constantly, eh, it's not really where you should be. Or, but there are also structural impediments, right? To, to young girls, I know that there's an imbalance in equity and uh, allocation of resources or field time. I, I found myself frustrated even uh, with my own kids growing up, you know, said somehow the boys were getting the better field. Better ice times, whatever it may be. So that still continues. And, and so you started an initiative called Permark and it's taken off, right? You've got it. I love it. The brand. Proudly. I'm going to have to get you one of these. <laughs> okay. <yes. laughs> Get it out to the West Coast. It would be, I mean, it's like fast and female, right? Just start being a I know. I, I, want to, I want to combine this at some point. It would be wonderful. Right on. Um, tell me about, you know, the initiative, how it was born. And then now it's really evolved too into uh, a podcast as well. Enjoying. So, uh, I basically, I just thought with my job too, um, it's such an amazing job and it's given me so many incredible opportunities and you just feel like you get to a point and whatever it may be, and it doesn't have to be sports casting, that you've just been given so much that you truly do want to give back. And I just thought to myself, okay, I'm at a point where, you know, we, I had this oh, wonderful endorsement deal with Under Armour still do and, uh, and TSN, obviously a, a national Canadian broadcaster. Um, my other sponsor, BioSteel, is in on it and Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. So having all these resources, especially when you have, you know, these companies and these people kind of behind you, you think, you know what, how can I, how can I do good? Like, how can I do something that would probably make me feel better than, you know, just going to cover sports on a daily basis? And my biggest passion in life is, is empowering girls. And I want them to see these incredible women that we have in our country and say, oh my God, I can basically do whatever the hell I want to do. And I can be, you know, the next Natalie Spooner, Tessa Virtue, whoever, Kia Nurse, you name it, Marie-Philippe Poulin. And I also, I'm sure we'll get into this too, you know, the lack of exposure for these women drives me nuts all the time. And I think to myself, these women, they also want to be doing this type of thing. So why not bring it all together? So why not bring an event and a day where I can bring in some girls that are in this critical point in their life, 15 to 18 years old, which is, we were talking about girls in sports. They're kind of on the borderline. There's a lot of social pressure going on at that point and get them to look at these women in our country and say, you know what? I am doing it right. I am, you know, this is the path that I'm supposed to be on. Um, you know, just maybe gain some confidence from these, these incredible women and uh, and pursue the right path so that was a big thing for me and it's now been four years unfortunately obviously due to the pandemic we couldn't do it in person this year tsn was kind enough to allow me to have a half an hour special um where i basically just contacted our top female canadian athletes across this country uh, to send a message to the girls in this country and uh, and it was amazing so uh, i wanted to be I want it to be at least double the size. I want to bring it, the, the plan was to bring it to the West Coast as well. So we've just kind of gotten backed up by a year now, but there's no doubt in my mind when it does get back, it's just going to be, it, it'll be bigger and better than ever. 
Outstanding. And tell me about what kind of, what does the day look like to bring these young girls together? And I agree, that's the tipping point right there. Yeah. So, and they're all, you know, they're like-minded and they don't just have to be athletes. That's kind of my big thing. Obviously sport is incredibly important to me, but you know what, there's a lot of girls that, you know, they're community leaders, they're on their student council, whatever it may be. So we want to include kind of everybody. So we bring them in. I normally have uh, a special guest off the top. Someone actually, I wanted to mix it up a little. So I either do like a newscaster or, you know, I've had two of the girls from the social uh, come who have explained kind of their story, their backstory. And then we take them through um, a fitness portion of it. So I kind of want to hit every aspect of life in this. And the fitness isn't difficult by any means. So again, for these non-athletes, it's not like we're making them do like wind sprints or anything. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then we do a, a lunch session and we do a, a nutrition breakdown because I'm also incredibly passionate about food and what I put in my body. And I think food education is a big thing that's not taught in, in public schools right now, which I would love to, I would love to put forward a little bit more. Um, and then the last one is basically like the biggest guest that I can get. Um, so we did have Tessa Virtue lined up. She did come on my program this year. Um, but needless to say, it's just someone that hopefully will leave them with that lasting impression that, oh my God, like, you know, this is what women are doing currently in this country. And, you know, the rest of us can do so much more. Love it so much. Love it so much. And, um, and you've also got a, a podcast. So there's some sort of continuity of these speakers and opportunities and, you're showcasing love it because if people can see it if girls can see it then they well, can it. and that's always my big thing right like if you know if, everyone's like oh why don't they put women's sports on tsn i might get that question no word of a lie to you once every two weeks minimum minimum i don't run the station and if i did run the station yeah i probably would but you know what too it's also a business right so you got to have companies that are going to step up and say, you know what, you know, Secret is doing an incredible job right now um, with the Professional Women's Hockey League, for example. They're putting a ton of money into it. Uh, Sonnet, um, NWSL has major sponsorships finally down in the States. I mean, how, you know, the WNBA isn't just cashing in after the wobble is beyond me, um, but they need to start there. And then the level of exposure, and we have done, I think, a really good job at TSN bringing so many more women's sports to air. Um, but it just needs to get up to a point where it's not, it's not shocking to see women's sports on TV. We're just watching sports. Right. So I think that, I think it will come. It's just way slower than I'd really like it to be. Yeah. And we're caught in that conundrum of, well, you know, you get mansplained about this all the time. Oh. Well, they don't bring in the, the box office, but but we have to invest in order to get that. We see that now with women's soccer, right? The yes. Stadium, we see it with women's rugby too. So once you get some funding in there, of course, and of course they can play great and they're really entertaining. So it's just that, yeah, that shifting. Love the uh, reference to these wonderful sponsors who are, who are digging in and investing for yeah. the right reasons, right? For exactly. This is a bit of a, you know, off script question, but you, you sparked it for me. Who do you think, who are you watching? Because you're watching lots of teams, lots of coaches, lots of leaders in sport. Who's doing a good job of developing athletes as leaders, in your opinion? Like in terms, in, like in terms of women's sports? Yeah, women and, and men as well, you know, but just bringing yeah. in this, account, this, yeah, leadership quality. Who's well, and I, think, and I think too, um, you know, I was always given a, a really – a really good line. I was always, I'm always an advocate of, you know, you should hire the best person for the job. And then this was a leader over at Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. And he looked at me and he was the main backer of her mark. He goes, yeah, he goes, you should give it to the best person, but you should also make sure that you're giving it equal opportunity to find that person. I've always loved that line. Um, you know, one of my, I think one of my favorite people right now that I would say is Masai Ujiri. Um, Masai, and again, too, it, it takes, I think, you know, for women to get ahead in sports, men are still, let's face it, you look at anything, men are still across the top all the way. It takes really strong men to say, you know what, we've got really great women, we need to put them in bigger roles. You know, even look at CEOs across Canada, it's absolutely ridiculous how, how limited it is when it comes to women. Mm -hmm. You know, Masai is one of those ones who I think, and he's not just doing it just to do it. He's putting in really intelligent women at the top right now. 
Um, and I think, you know, giving someone like Britt Donaldson that assistant coach role. Um, and she, ha she has a great story. We were doing this interview for International Women's Day and she was in a meeting and Masai just called her after and he's like, why didn't she speak up? She's like, well, I forget what her excuse was, but he's like, you need to speak up. You know, you knew the answer to that question and you need to speak up. And I guarantee you, Britt's spoken up in every meeting since. So sometimes it takes a really great leader like that to say, I know the potential's there. Do not be intimidated. You are good enough at your job, but you just make, you need that confidence to do it. And then once they do it once, guess what? It's like old hat. So I would say from a personal standpoint, that's who I see closest in, in the sports world right now to, to what I do, uh, who's really pushing women. Right on. Love it. Yeah. And you need that sponsorship, that encouragement, that support to, to, to keep driving. Beautiful. What do you think are still, you've mentioned a few of the barriers. Uh, we've talked about cultural and structural and kind of social. Um, what do you think are the still the biggest barriers for, for young women in sport? Oh, I think, I think the biggest there are so many barriers still, like, you know, as you said too, like, you know, simple things like ice times, timings of games, um, being overshadowed by these big leagues at a grassroots level. And it does start at a grassroots level. Um, you know, I know that, you know, we've got the QMJHL, the OHL, the WHL, for example, you know, that's a, that's a league that's shown across national sports broadcasters of, you know, these young men in their teens. I don't see anything like that for women at that point. I think the biggest thing though, is I think it starts from the beginning, in my opinion. You know, I got a lot of great friends. I don't have any kids, but I have a lot of great friends who have kids and their kids, boys and girls, are so exposed at a young age. Like we're talking about like, you know, four, five, six years old when they start watching sports with their parents and they expose them as much to women's sports as they do to men's. So it's not a shocker for them when they get to like, 15 and are like watching a hockey game and then they're just like oh my goodness there's you know a women's event on you know what I mean mm -hmm. and I, I just think I think if we started with that if we started at a lower level to exposing our kids to both equally and not being like men's sports women's sports just sports I think it would help drastically but I mean it, as I said too it's going to start with more exposure for women's sports as well so one thing at a time I guess yeah, but you make a great point about those 15, 16, 17 year olds and making sure that gets coverage because there's no, there's no box office argument there, right? Right. Be no, I, I totally, and you know what too, like even like something like this past weekend when we saw Sarah Fuller um, kick for Vanderbilt, right? So that was a really great, and I loved covering that story. I think that's the coolest thing ever. And just the way she even spoke, right? You know, she had you know, play like a girl on the back of her helmet and, you know, young girls, everything she did this weekend was about young women watching her do what she did well, and that's kick a football. And I think too, there should come a day when, you know what, we've got female kickers all over the NCAA and that I don't think is that far away whatsoever. And we're not shocked by it. Like we're not making headlines about it. We're just saying, you know, so-and-so nailed a 42 yarder. Oh, way to go. You know, Jane Doe, but I think it's getting there. I would love to see the day, though, where this isn't a shock anymore. You know what I mean? It's just normal. Yeah. Press, press. Okay. And so to bring full circle, this idea that you're, you said, I don't take my uh, job for granted. And you're talking about her using her platform as well, making sure leveraging every aspect of what she's doing <laughs> to have an impact. Uh, I, I've always believed athletes, if they have that platform, they should be leveraging it. We saw a lot of athletes doing that this past year. Loved it. Uh, what more do you think could be done? Or, or do you agree? Do you think athletes should be role models or should be leveraging their platform? How do you feel and, about it? And like, and don't get me wrong. I work with a lot of awesome male athletes. Like I, I mean, I think I get to work with one of the greatest sports teams in the Toronto Raptors. I couldn't ask for some of those guys have just been absolutely incredible to work with and are still incredible to work with. Um, but I think women athletes, I think females, I think they feel more of a responsibility. Um, you know, especially like if you look at their social media, if you go down, for example, the majority of the Canadian women's hockey team right now, I guarantee you on nearly a hundred percent of their pages, you would see something trying to inspire a young girl in this country. 
Um, I know a lot of them personally, not, not toot my own horn here, but people I know, but I know it is important to them. And I know they know how important they are um, to the next generation. I also, my coworker now is Kia Nurse. Oh, she's been hired by TSN. And I was out playing, uh, just pick up basketball. Uh, this was I don't know, a few weeks back. And a young girl was shooting and they came up and they're like, hey, TSN, we're like, yeah. And I sent her her Mark sweater and I said, uh, you know, I know Kia Nurse. And you should have seen, like, I did not exist to this young girl. Like, she's like, what's she like? What is she like? Where, where is she? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know where she is right now, but she is, you know, but Kia, and Kia, I think, understands that. Like, Kia understands that every young basketball player in this country looks up to her and she tries as hard as she can to give back. I mean, she's got an AAU team in her name now. I know that she's been doing some really cool stuff with the Jordan brand uh, for the next generation of women. So it's not that the guys, you know what I mean? They don't care about it. They do care about it. Um, but I think when it comes to the females, they're just a little more in tune with how much these young girls need from them. Yeah, right on. Thank you. And love that, uh, love that plug for social media, because I really believe that too, that the athletes all could be leveraging their, their accounts uh, with more intention. They probably need a bit of support. Not everybody's a natural, but we could probably do a better job around that too, with our national team athletes too. And it's yeah. interesting that COVID has prompted a lot of that work, you know, showing what they're doing, but also exposing everybody to them. Yeah. And that, you know what? And that's the thing too, like, you know, I go back to the WNBA, right. And you know, where COVID has had just awful effects, like on so many different parts of our world, for sure. I mean, you could look at a positive as just the exposure for that wobble. I mean, a lot of pe more people tuned into the WNBA this season than they've ever tuned into the whole, the WNBA orange hoodie was literally like the best selling thing because the NBA guys started wearing it. It's funny, one little thing blows up on social media and all these guys are wearing it into their press conferences and walking into the arena and surprise, surprise, everyone wants that hoodie. It's the simple of thing, simple things that can make such an astronomical difference. Yeah, and that lives back to that team, that idea of, you know, seeing strength and supporting one another too. I love it so much. Listen, Kate, that was fabulous. Any last words or any last things you'd like to, messages you'd like to share? Uh, I just want to say thank you for having me, as always. And you know what? I appreciate the support. And I know we've done a couple of these now, but uh, I think I've always believed that good women attract good women. And together, oh boy, I think it's a force to be reckoned with, in my opinion. So uh, thank you for having the time. And thank you for just talking about Hermark, too. Um, you know, just a huge soft spot for Hermark. And I think the more, uh, the more I get to chat about it and get the country to understand what it's all about, the better. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kate. You have a great day. Thank you. You too. We'll be watching. Bye.